just met Robert about two years ago. Uh, I was introduced to him by Brother Mike Snyder, who many of you know was uh, the administrator of Mount Zion Bible Church for many, many years. And uh, Brother, Brother Bob, uh, yes, you can call him Bob Jones. Um, I asked him that last year, so that's fine, no problem. Brother Bob has uh, written his latest book, uh, The Epistle of James, which is a devotional commentary on James, and it was just printed, and we received it just days before the conference began. We have those books on our book table, as well as his other eight books, tremendous works, and they are our teachers. And so we encourage you to take a copy of each of his books. And I asked Bob to write, or to uh, prepare a message, rather, on the value of a writing and printing ministry. Some of you have uh, the gift of writing, and uh, you've never written anything, perhaps, that uh, you could share with unsaved people or other believers. You may want to consider that. And Bob is going to come and talk about the value of such a ministry for churches, for individual believers, in propagating and sharing the Word of God. So, Brother Bob, would you come and share with us? Well, greetings. Most of what I have to say on the subject that Pastor Joe just uh, mentioned to you, I'm taking from examples in Scripture and then making some inferences for us from those examples. And I'm not aware of any uh, precept in the Bible which commands us to write books. Uh, almost to the contrary, it seems that Solomon in Ecclesiastes 12, 12 tells us of making many books there is no end and much study is the weariness of the flesh. Well, most of us, however, uh, recognize the error when somebody says, the only book I need is the Bible. Because we realize that God doesn't gift us as individuals with all the understanding and all the knowledge there is in this world of his truth even though we have our Bibles, and it's all in our Bibles, we don't question that. But if we, if we only uh, depend on our own insights, we really deprive ourselves of uh, nourishment and edification for our souls, which we could obtain. And so, uh, I want to discuss this issue of a, a writing ministry under two heads today. The first uh, heading I'll call its intrinsic or objective value. Intrinsic just means it's a word meaning that it's what it's worth in itself. It has its own value. It's objective value. We, we learn this from uh, what a writing ministry has meant in the church from the earliest days of the church until now. The historical use of writing ministry. And then in the second place, I want to talk about as an estimated or subjective value. In other words, what do we as individuals think it's worth? What value do we place upon it as individual believers? Well, first of all, the objective value or the intrinsic value, I like to uh, mention five things about that. A writing ministry is valuable, first of all, because it preserves the truth. Um, Thomas Manthan, I'll read you a quote from him. He's one of the outstanding Puritan writers that we have his works available today for us. He said, A transient voice is more easily mistaken and forgotten than a standing authentic record. As Samuel thought Eli spake when the Lord first revealed his word unto him. You remember the incident in uh, Samuel's life when he was a child in the, uh, and Eli was priest. And Samuel heard his voice at night. And he thought Eli was calling him, but it wasn't Eli. It was really the Lord speaking to Samuel. Well, uh, but it was a voice, and voices come and they go. And uh, Mr. Matt says, a standing record, authentic record, in other words, something that's written, uh, 
offers a more sure ground for our faith to rest upon than a voice from heaven could be. Now he says in effect the same thing that Peter tells us in his second epistle. Because you remember Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration with uh, the Lord Jesus and saw that miraculous uh, occasion and then heard the voice from heaven uh, where God said, This is my beloved Son whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. But then he tells us in his second epistle, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 19, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What his meaning is that the written scriptures are a sure ground for our faith, and even that voice he heard from heaven, which was God speaking from heaven. And that's true for all of us here today because we have the volume of God's Word in our hands or in our laps or with us today. Then in uh, Deuteronomy 17, 18, and 19, we read that it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. This was a command that God gave to every king in Israel. He was supposed to write his own copy of the law of Moses. So he'd have it, so he could read from it, so he could uh, apply it in his rule as king. So God thought it was necessary for every king to do this. It wasn't like uh, David wrote one copy, for instance, and passed it on down the line. No, each king had to write his own copy. And in that way, the truth was preserved. And then we can see in Proverbs 25, verse 1, it says, These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. Well, if you look in the, in the uh, genealogy, you see there were eight, king, eight kings between Solomon, who wrote the Proverbs, and Hezekiah came eight kings later. So in all those years, hundreds of years, however, I don't know how many years it was exactly, but those writings that Solomon left were still blessing the Israelites. And they were handed down, passed down, and even written down, obviously, in order for that to be be true. So we can say, making a conclusion from these instances uh, of uh, Samuel and uh, uh, Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration and uh, the kings in Israel and the Proverbs of Solomon that due to the frailty of human memory, truth that needs to be communicated from one generation to the next needs to be preserved in writing. We just won't preserve it any other way accurately and safely. But then we have the case, next of all, a second reason for our second value of writing is that sometimes truths are forgotten or neglected. And writing is useful in recovering or rediscovering these truths. Now, in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, we have the life of King Josiah. Uh, recorded for us. He became king at a very young age. He was only eight years old when he began to reign in Judah. <clears throat> but he was a very godly young, young child. And uh, he began to bring about a reformation in Judah. And one thing that he did, he purged away all the idols, had them destroyed. And then he wanted to uh, cleanse the temple. And so what he did, he took up a collection to do that with money. And in the process of, of this, they found a copy of the Law of Moses, which is just somewhere in the temple. And they brought it to him, they read it to him. And uh, I'd like to uh, just read a few verses to show you what his response was when he heard this written, written Law of Moses. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Second Chronicles uh, chapter 34 and verse 14. <coughs> It says, And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the high priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. 
And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found a book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the word king back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord, and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers, into the hand of the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the law, that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Abdon the son of Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asaiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire the Lord for me, and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. Well, we see how that godly king responded when the written word came home to his conscience and to his understanding. And from that also, a further revival in Judah, a, a revival like was never seen before. And then we can also think in more recent years, in our own lifetime, uh, in the 1960s in our country, there was a, a revival, not, I wouldn't maybe call it a revival, but a reformation or a, a reviving of the Reformed faith. When the writings of our uh, Reformers, the Puritans, and other godly men from the past became much more widely uh, reprinted and circulated. And most of us today are still benefiting from those years because we have uh, that Reformed faith brought right to our doors, we might say, in, in the churches that have been reformed and writings that are available to us readily in our country. We have no excuse if we don't avail ourselves of them. They are so plentiful. So that use also of uh, re rediscovery of the truth. And, but then there's also, as Pastor Joe was just speaking, uh, another value of writing ministry is for the continuation of a man's ministry after his death. Uh, in Revelation 14, 13, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. So we can say that the labors of a righteous man will cease at his death. He, he's, he'll rest from his own labors, but... They will continue to bring blessing to those who are in the world, and they will increase his reward as he's in heaven. Amen. Uh, just for one example of this, it can be asked here, how many do you suppose followed John Bunyan to heaven as he read book uh, Pilgrim's Progress? Probably no, no way to account for the number that have done so. Uh, Hebrews 13, 7 says, uh, Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Now this is talking about mainly uh, godly pastors. We are to follow their faith. We are to uh, submit to their rule. But it can also be applied to uh, those who have written things for us to read. Godly writers. And really that should be the reason, that should be the, probably one of the primary objectives we have when we select something to read because there's so much we can select. We have to prioritize what we do select. But we want to read that which we can follow the faith of the author. We, would, we don't want to read him because he's has a famous name or because uh, He's gifted, we like his style, particularly although that helps us read. But we want to follow his faith, so that, that should be a guideline when we select things to read. And then Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now just a, a word about Abel's uh, sacrifice. We know that Cain and, and Abel were brothers and uh, Abel offered a sacrifice that God accepted and Cain, Cain's sacrifice was refused. 
And it's thought that God sent fire from heaven that consumed Abel's sacrifice on the altar, but it not for Cain's sacrifice in the same manner. And then the, the fire from heaven showed God's uh, acceptance. Well, we could apply that today, I think, accurately and say that God's Holy Spirit is the fire that uh, accompanies a man's ministry if it's an acceptable ministry to God. The Holy Spirit will work through that man's ministry, whether it's preaching, writing, uh, <clears throat> witnessing on the street. Uh, and then, if, if that's the true of his life, it will continue to be true after his life. Mm. And we know that because we read Mr. Spurgeon's sermons. We read things like that. It's just like the man is preaching to us mm. as though he was alive. Mm. And so we want, to, we want that to be true of our own lives. But that's a good reason for writing. Because if God's Spirit moves you or enables you or helps you in writing, it will... He will continue to do so when you're long gone, but the writings are still in hands. And then there's the value of disciple making. I won't spend, I'll just mention this because this has been an obvious keynote in all many of the messages we've heard already and testimonies that when we talk about Christ's commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, <laughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Uh, we need tracks to do this, as well as the preached word, because tracks can go where many times a preacher does not go, or, and they go to people who will never come to a preacher, obviously. So they are effective <clears throat> preachers in themselves. And then when people are being trained and, and raised up, for the ministry, if any of you are involved in that labor, you know that it's, it, help, it helps you not only to lecture, to speak, but to have study helps, things for that, of that sort. So I'll <clears throat> pass on to the next thing, and that's the last of the five things I wanted to mention about the value of the written ministry. It's also salt and light in the world. Salt and light in the world, and this, our world is very uh, putrefied putrefying in these days. We need much more salt and light than we <coughs> see working. But uh, some years ago, uh, Summit Books, which is probably from the Baker Bookhouse, and I'm not here an advertiser for Baker Bookhouse, but they had a series of uh, books they published under Summit Books, and on these books was placed a quote by Daniel Webster. And I'll read that to you. It's very significant. He said, if religious books are not widely circulated among the masses in this country, I do not know what is going to become of us as a nation. If truth be not diffused, error will be. If God and his word are not known and received, the devil and his works will gain the ascendancy. <clears throat> if the evangelical volume does not reach every hamlet, the pages of a corrupt and licentious literature will. If the power of the gospel is not felt throughout the length and breadth of the land, anarchy and misrule, degradation and misery, corruption and deadness will reign without mitigation or end. Now, when do you suppose he said that? It was in 1823. Now, we ought to really be blushing today with shame at how that prophecy has come to pass in our nation. And, uh, and yet, we still have freedom to publish and distribute without hindrance for the most part, and the means to do so, so we ought to do it with zeal. Maybe it won't always be this way for us. Well, I'd like to, to move on then to the estimated or the subjective value of a written ministry, because this is really where we sit here today. We want to know what, what it's worth to us as individual Christians. Uh, Proverbs 17, 16 raises a fitting question. It says, or it asks, Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? Well, I just, I just mentioned that uh, quote by Daniel Webster on, that, on the Summit Series books. 
Because when I was, uh, or back in the 80s, I was a, a traveling book salesman for gospel mission books out of Shorter, Montana. Uh, like a coal porter, as they were called. And I, I, during those years I did that, I saw firsthand why Daniel Webster's prophecy is being fulfilled in our country. Uh, even though these books were affordably priced, uh, books by Mr. Bunny, Mr. Spursy, Mr. Pink, they would sit in a book rack in a retail store, a drugstore, a grocery store, or a Christian bookstore, so-called, for weeks and months, and nobody would touch them. Uh, people have no heart for reading that kind of book. And that's true of most church attenders as well, as just the general public. Uh, the truth is not worth anything to them because these books had the truth. Uh, now, today we have even more things to, uh, to distract us, uh, as we know. Uh, media, uh, things that can occupy our attention rather than books, but, but because of this, most people are offended if you, if you say they're a fool. You know, that scripture we, I just read says the fool has no heart and understanding. But, uh, or he doesn't know there's a price in his hand. He can, he has, he can get wisdom. And we, we think of how much we know, them, how, how, how much information we have today which our fathers and our grandfathers never had. And we don't, we don't think we're foolish. But for all that we have access to, all the knowledge that we can say we have, we're no better for it if we don't know Christ, uh, if, if we're not prepared for the day of death and judgment, all that knowledge doesn't help us at all. And we need to gain true wisdom. And I'd like to uh, use the examples, some examples from Scripture to show that the apostles and our Lord Jesus Christ believe this also and taught this to us. <clears throat> First of all, the Apostle Paul put a value on books. Uh, he said in 2 Timothy 4.13, The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. Now the parchments probably refer to the scriptures, but he also specifically mentioned books. So books were meaningful to the Apostle Paul. We don't have to think that they weren't. And then, as Pastor Downing was preaching his uh, message yesterday on Paul, Paul's sermon on Mars Hill, he referred to this verse of Scripture uh, where Paul made reference to the work of secular poets. And he said, in verse 28 of Acts 17, For in him we live and move and have our being, and certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And Pastor Downing as well quoted many of these Greek poets in his presentation yesterday. But if you read like Thomas Manton or, or Thomas Boston or, or not Boston but Watson, Thomas Watson, these old Puritans, scholarly writers, they're many times they're bringing in quotes from secular men, not, not even Christians. And they don't do this to prove the authority of Scripture. Rather, they're showing that uh, the ability that God gives to some men to reason rightly uh, is usable for us. You know, we can draw from, from that. It doesn't contradict Scripture if they're, if they're using their abilities to reason rightly as they should. So there's the Apostle Paul's example. Then another example that... Uh, shows us the significance of, of the written word is the Apostle Jude. And he quotes in his epistle in the New Testament, it's just one chapter, but in verses 14 and 15 it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all that are upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them, all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. 
Now this is Holy Scripture, but yet it's also in the Apocrypha. So Jude drew this out of the Apocrypha, and the Holy Spirit inspired it to be, become Scripture. <laughs> so we can make a conclusion then that uh, as well as uh, we need other things or other things beside the Bible are helpful to us as individuals, other sources of knowledge are helpful to us as ministers of the word, as well as God's words, is the, is the foundation of all truth. Because here the Apostle Paul quotes secular poets, Jude quotes the Apocrypha, and all ends up in the inspired word of God. So use, use these things that you have available to you as helps to you and to your ministry. Not departing from the scripture. That's foremost always. But then we want to go really now, those are just kind of uh, to uh, whet your appetite as examples, but I would like to use the example of the Lord Jesus Christ himself because when I was trying to think of how I could bring this message, I thought, well, what, what is in the scripture that shows us what Jesus himself thought about books? Did he ever have anything to say about books in, in all his ministry? Well, I finally uh, I was able to think of one scripture, and if you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 2, we'll read that together. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse uh, 41. And the context of this is uh, Jesus being 12 years old and his parents going every year to the feast of the Passover in Jerusalem. Or, Joseph and Mary, not obviously his <clears throat> father, but Mary and Joseph, and they would take their family, and Jesus being with them. And it says, uh, verse 41, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in their company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. So here we have a situation. Uh, first of all, we'll, we'll have to say that Jesus, though he is God, was and was God at this time, fully God, yet as a child, he's, he uh, went through the same process as, as we do of growing up and learning knowledge. Uh, and so here's what he's doing. He's sitting in the temple with these doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Well, we could say these doctors were probably the authors of that day. If anybody wrote books, these are probably the authors of the books of Jesus' day, and, or the essays, or whatever was in print. So here he was, sitting among them, not... not uh, being holy their teacher because it says he was both hearing them and asking them questions. So he did, obviously wasn't in a way of, of despising them. He was, one, he was in their midst as one of them. And we can learn from this that he did not despise this then of method of gaining knowledge and that we still apply to ourselves the written word. And another inference was that he considered this important enough that everything else was set aside for him to do it. Uh, in other words, his parents went on home, but he stayed there. That was his work. Uh, that was his business, to do that. And uh, he called it his father's business. Uh, now, that expression, his father's business, doesn't mean, obviously, that he had to... Uh, had, he probably had some, I'll say it this way, he probably had some household duties at home <laughs> and for Joseph and Mary. That might have been thought his business. Or maybe he needed to learn the occupation of Joseph, become a carpenter. Well, we know that he did these things. 
Uh, because verse 51 goes on and says, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. They were all concerned. Where was he? Why, why, was it? why did he stay behind? And uh, when they found him, I guess I should back up there and, and read where we left off. Uh, when they found him, verse 45 uh, and 46, he was in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee, sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So he, he was subject to his parents. And later on, we read in Matthew, he's, ca he's called the carpenter's son. So he also learned that occupation as a, as a young man growing up. He did, he did those things, the commonplace things of life, the necessary things of life. But yet, he never called those his father's business. His father's business was to, to gain wisdom and to communicate that wisdom as he was doing as a 12-year-old youth or child. And we, we get a glimpse here of what was most in his heart. It was this thing of truth and wisdom. And so how, why I say all this, we can apply this to our own lives. Because uh, if uh, we are Jesus, God the Father's children, as Jesus was the Son of God, the one Son of God, the divine Son of God, but we are children of God by faith. The business that Jesus had in his Father's business is also our business, our Father's business. We have to take that as our business to gain wisdom, to gain knowledge. And I'd like to uh, bring to your attention three scriptures which uh, I believe uh, would give us more help or application. <coughs> help to make more application. The first would be Proverbs 4, verse 7, which says, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. And in Proverbs, wisdom is a name that's actually given to Christ himself. So we need to search for wisdom. We need to search for Christ and where, where he can be found. Obviously, you don't go looking for something where you know it's not going to be found. You search for where you can find it. So that means if we're going to find Christ, we're going to find wisdom. We have his word, we have the Bible, and then we need uh, also to search good books for it. Uh, Spiritual-minded authors, holy men and godly men who have written for us. And I would, I would say one comment to you or one word of advice to you about reading uh, these books. That some of them, maybe from the old writers, maybe they're not easy to read or, or contemporary writers for that concern also, that matter also. <clears throat> but uh, when you take a book and start it, sometimes you, your first impression is, I don't like this author. Uh, and you put the book aside. But if he's a good man, read it through to the end. And I think many times you'll find, as you read on in a book, you'll, you'll form a different opinion of the author as you read and persevere and see what he really has to say to you to the end. Give, give, him that, give him that opportunity, that opportunity to teach you. Well, then another verse of uh, Scripture, Psalm 63, verse 1. And this is David's uh, psalm. He says, O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. So form a, form a habit in your life of seeking God early. Now, there are at least three ways we can do that. Uh, early has the meaning of seeking God earnestly or prayerfully and daily. Uh, so when you, when you have your, your uh, quiet time or your devotions, or whatever time you set aside to read, 
make certain that you seek conscious fellowship with God. You don't just, well, I read my chapter, it's done, or I prayed five minutes, and it's over, on with life. Be earnest, be prayerful. Seek the fellowship of, with God in your, in your devotions. George Mueller's uh, habit was, or his, his conviction was, the most important thing for him to do every day was to have his soul happy in God in the morning before he went about the rest of the day's activity and service. We, that's, a good, that's a good habit to imitate. If you're so happy with God every day, and sometimes that's not easy. You wake up, you're tired maybe, or your, your problems of the day before come back to mind. First thing, you know, you got to lay them aside, and it's not easy. But you should learn to learn to have fellowship, conscious fellowship with God day by day. And that's what it means to seek Him early. Another way of seeking Him early is just what it says. You seek Him early in the morning, before your mind and body are weird. <coughs> the time we give to the Lord doesn't have to be great in terms of amount sometimes, but we should, we should have our mind totally upon what we read and what we meditate upon. In other words, God word, God's Word shouldn't have to compete with a number of, other amount, number of things in our mind. We should have our mind wholly devoted to God's Word. And do it the first thing. Do it the first part of the day, if possible. But then another meaning of early is early in life. Before the pains and the sicknesses of, uh, of old age overtake you. Don't wait till you're old and think, well, I'll have plenty of time then to, to read. Don't, uh, don't <coughs> assume that. Uh, but whatever your age is here today, because we have people of all ages I see in the audience, uh, Learn to, to, to seek God in His Word and, and knowledge and wisdom and, and good writings. Do it uh, before any more time passes. That way it applies to us all. We're all seeking God early if we, if we do it now. Don't, don't let another uh, period of our life slip away. So beware of making excuses. Here I'll try to be more specific. Men in the audience, you know, you're you're the breadwinner. You're you're working every day. You're working hard, and uh, you think, well, uh, this this work of mine, and it's important. It's, it takes all my time. I don't have time to read. Well, beware of that attitude. Don't wait till you till your work's over and you've got your uh, your uh, finances all in place and you're secure and you know, you think. That day's coming somewhere down the line, somewhere in the future. Because you need to be building up your soul every day so you can work, <clears throat> so you can be a better uh, employee or a better uh, uh, manager in your work. Ladies, uh, you have the same thing with children in your house, and you think, well, when the house is quiet and the children are gone, then I'll read. Well, beware of that. You need to. Somehow you need to work work that into your daily life now. You with all what you're doing. And young people, you think, well, uh, I've got to have fun. My my friends are here, and I you know, and I I can't be reading books, and I can't you know forget that. You know. No, learn a habit of, of using a little time to uh, teach yourself from from God's word and from books, and then. Unconverted, perhaps some of you here today are your parents require you to be here, that's why you're here. Otherwise, you'd be somewhere else. Or somebody, a friend of you, invited you to come, and that's why you're here. Well, more than anyone else, I'll, I'll apply this to you today. Uh, don't make the excuse or don't fall into the air that, uh, like Felix said to Paul, when Paul had witnessed to him. And he says, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. That's, that was his answer. When I have a convenient season. Well, that convenient season never came for Felix. And it might not come for you. Because God's word is very clear. He says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And also, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So you, you don't have the option to... Uh, Call, 
God to you, he calls you to come to him. And the book table here in this conference has things on it specifically for unconverted people. If you, if you know that that's your case, if you know that Christ is not your Lord, look on that book table and, and find what's there for you to read. And read it. And read it with a prayer to God that he would bless it to you. And there's even a promise that you can apply, I believe. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asks, receives. He that seeks, finds. And him that knocks, it shall be opened. So I just leave that with you. And then another scripture. This is my last. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, we always think of that, first of all, and we ought to because that's the way Christ applied it to our money, our, our possessions, uh, our temporal needs that we have in life, that we need to always give God first. We, that's why we give our money. That's why we give our time to Him. But it does apply to every area of life. It's a, it's a general principle of life for a Christian, a disciple. And it applies to your time. Because uh, sometimes uh, it's, it becomes a pure act of faith and obedience to read the scriptures or to read a good book when other things are clamoring for your time. But you should do it because of this promise that you won't be the loser by doing it. Uh, make that your business. Make your Heavenly Father's business your business to read His Word, to read books to feed your soul. Uh, you won't be the loser. You never are the loser. Put God first, Christ first, the truth of your soul, the needs of your soul, ahead of other things. <clears throat> and then make this a daily habit. Because as you uh, grow in loving the truth, you'll also grow in hating error. And that's what this conference has been trying to teach us. How to do how to how to escape error? Well, do both. Love the truth more, and you will hate the error, mm -hmm. and it won't be as uh, much of a snare to any of us. So, may the Lord bless these things, and let's pray. Yeah. Our Heavenly Father, we we know that you have given us your Word, all Scripture is given by you. Your inspiration is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness, that we might as your servants be perfect and thoroughly furnished in all good works. We never want to get away from this. We never want to neglect our Bibles and that you have condescended to us to give us so many helps in writing and we ought to treasure these also and give them a high priority in our lives and time and learn to worship you even by these means pray that you would help us to do so and guide us in the selection of things to read and most of all in learning and applying your eternal word through Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.